Welcome to the Beyond Cinema Studio presented by Celebs.com up here at Sundance. Stacey Bassett. I'm so happy to be with you. <laughs> this is kind of a cool time to sit down and chat actually because we chatted to your lead actresses Maggie Siff and Robin Wygett after the film premiered and you were kind of caught up in negotiations on selling the movie and now you've kind of lived the dream. First time filmmaker coming up to Sundance selling your movie to the Weinstein Company Radius. Um, How does that feel? Does it feel like a whirlwind? Or? I feel like I feel like I'm a cool kid for the first time in my life. Um, um, no, I, I, I'm excited about Radius because you know what you have is the sort of um, you have this amazing all these new platforms with Tom and Jason, and then you have the sort of marketing side of 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 the Weinstein Company right. and, all, and everything that, that comes with that. And the thing about it that I love is that, you know, after the premiere we realized, you know, we really have to be in service to this piece, you know, lots of good press, you know, we wanted to elevate Robin and Maggie and all the other actors in the piece and we just really wanted the best home for, for it and when they came calling we were just like, are you kidding me? Of course. Like, yeah. let's make this work. Let's just try to make this work because we know that the we know that everything that we've done to try to make the piece what it is, they're gonna elevate that. You know, they're gonna really go for it. Yeah. So I, I like that about them. It's they're kind of they're smart. You yeah. know. It was interesting as well when we had Maggie and Robin in here because obviously Robin was on Deadwood, Calamity Jane, and um, and Maggie's been on Sons of Anarchy yeah. and Mad Men, yeah. and then and we were saying like how well, especially Sons of Anarchy and Deadwood were so testosterone driven that this is kind of the flip side of that camera because it is so intimate and, and pretty. But maybe not. You know, I mean, I mean, think about Kurt Sutter and think about the kind of intimacy that he brings to what he does, you know? He goes there. Yeah. And I mean, I think that Deadwood is, was all about being brave. And I think that, you know, Kurt Sutter and Sons of Anarchy, he, he's, he's all about being brave. He's about being out there. And I consider myself somebody who wants to be brave. Yeah. You know, so I think that you know, people who use Robin and Maggie, by extension, want to see brave talent on the screen. Yeah. And I think that's the sort of through line there. What was it when you, where did you first meet Robin to talk about this role? Um, it was funny because I had, I, you know, this is my first film, so the casting process for a first time filmmaker is really, it's, it's not easy because I didn't, I remember Ann Davison, who's my casting director, she said, well, do you want somebody, you know, what do you want? Do you want somebody? And I said, I just want, I want a New York stage actor to do this. I want somebody who can disappear within a role. I want somebody who knows what they're doing, you know? And we, she sent me a list and I was like, none of them, you know? And, I, and, and, and she sent me another list and I'm like, none of them. Michael Sarah you know? wasn't a good choice. No, Michael Sarah would have been an amazing choice for Abby, <laughs> but I don't think he was a bit, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a great, that would have been very brave. But, uh, no, but I, I just watched Robin's reel. I didn't know her work. And I was like, I can't swear. Um, I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> and um, the thing is, is like, if she was a singer, I know we've talked, we talk about this. She'd have like a six octave range. It's incredible. Like she could be so over the top and then she could be, you know, with, I'm not saying over the top in a pejorative way, but like, you know, you talk, see Calamity Jane and it's like, <laughs> you know, and, and then you see some of her softer performances and you're like, you're right. Because I knew that I was going to be like, less, less. So yeah. I wanted somebody that could bring a real performance, you know, and yeah. knew what the hell they were doing. So <laughs> she, um, she can do that. And so when we shot, we had various different tones and different themes and whatever. And that was when I met her, what we discussed, yeah. you know, what can you bring to this, you know? And I saw a subtlety in her when we talked for the first time and I knew, you know, just how she listened and how I listened to her, that it was it was going to be good, yeah. you know. And where she, where said, did that first, where did that take place? Um, I first met Robin. Um, I took her out to dinner. I she was shooting a film, and then I sort of scooped her up at seven o'clock, and I, you know, I put her into my uh, my uh, car, and I took her to Frankie's in Brooklyn because I wanted to get her away from the city. I wanted to have a you know nice table outside, and I wanted to talk so it was summer. And, you know, I kind of, I was kind of like, 
whining and dining her, you know, because I, I just felt like it was important. It was an important meeting. I wanted her to do it. She wanted to do it. But I could tell she was scared to do it. Like she was, there was, there, she had some hesitancy. Well, I mean, course, you, know? you would have to have a, you know, a real establishment of trust, even with someone more seasoned who she, you know, might go in a little bit more blind to. But working with a first time filmmaker as well, did you feel like you had to sell yourself? Like, Absolutely. Did you show her anything or was it really just all about the script? You know what I showed her? I showed her um, an audition with uh, Derry Fennis, um, who played woman number one. She was the college student in the okay. film. Okay, yeah. And I was like, look at this, you know? And she was so smart in this audition. We had already really begun to look for that character because we knew that would take a long time to yeah. find. And uh, she, I remember she sort of took my iPhone. She was like, oh, okay, I, I think I'm kind of getting this a little bit more, oh, the tone of what you're trying to do. And I was like, right, right. And so I showed her that. I showed her that audition, and, I, and we talked about the script. And I just tried to make it sort of as light as possible, you know? I just tried to show her my sensibility. Like, I asked her to come to Montclair. She didn't have any time to do it, but, but um, she went back to L.A. But I think we, I don't think we... We spent three months every day on the phone. I think it was it was a process of getting to know each other, a process of understanding. And you know, um, it's funny. You know, I I remember after I shot this the film, I remember watching a, an interview with um, with Steve McQueen, and um, we weren't making shame. We knew we weren't making shame, but. He was talking about working with Michael Fassbender, and he said it was sort of like a, it's sort of like a process of falling in love. Yeah. And that was absolutely correct. It was just you know I mean I have a wife and children and everything, but it was just you know Robin in many ways became my mirror on this project and kind of brought things out in me that I'd never seen before, and I I I adore her for that. Yeah. I just adore her for that. She's how, amazing. How important was it for you to have the vindication along the way? I mean, obviously you'd already written the script, you're already towards production, but getting those, you know, the Adrian Shelley grant, the Dream grant, you know, that sort of stuff along yeah. the way, was yeah. that sort of like, you know, really uh, confidence building, kind of coming into the shoot? Well, I think the great thing now is that, like, I'm not the only one. You know, it's like that Adrian Shelley grant was born out of necessity. You know, Andy Ostroy, that's born out of necessity. We need, we need you know, women need money, and particularly for post-production and funding. Um, and the Gotham grant was born out of, out of need. Calvin Klein does that. So the thing is, is that, you know, I wasn't up against myself. You know what I'm saying? Like, there were a lot of other women, yeah. strong women, doing really creative things. And we, took, we take a great amount of pride in that we, we were all part of this narrative lab. And we took a lot of pride in working together. And so it was nice to, it was nice to win it. You know, if Visra won it or Liam won it or any of the other ones, maybe when Kimmy won it, it would have been just as good. Yeah. But it was nice. It allows you to throw a, a, a wedding for your movie at Sundance. <laughs> Which is really what it is. Yeah, those millions of dollars. That come from <laughs> it's those so, yeah, it's so great to be able to do it. And it was just like, phew, okay, this is great, this is great. And these, the IFP guys have been amazing, yeah. amazing. And for you, on the flip side, working on commercials and things like that, um, was that always for you a stepping stone to making film? Or I, was, was that... I was more of a media person. I was more of an entrepreneur that way. We'd go into companies and, you know, uh, partners and I, and we would see what they needed, essentially. And sometimes it was commercial, sometimes it was music videos, sometimes it was new media. But what it was is marketing. You know, I understood marketing in companies, and yeah. I understood platforms and what succeeded and what didn't succeed. And I'm glad that I had that background because it wasn't just purely aesthetic. It was about um, understanding what makes a successful product or brand. And I. I care about that kind of stuff so that when and I never thought about making feature films I wrote scripts before and they were they were good they were fine but you could I, I didn't want to be you know slinging scripts you yeah. know to people because I just felt like I needed to legitimize myself in other ways and when these platforms came along where you could distribute self-distribute it came became more of a pragmatic idea it became more practical I think women are more practical and that's why they're coming into being directors now which is kind of ironic given the sense of this film is all about taking that little bit of risk or the, a, accepting that little bit of danger. So you don't see this process of making this film as perhaps for you a little sense of uh, 
embracing the unknown. It what is do? completely about embracing the unknown. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm at the point in my life where the basic rules and moral forms don't make sense anymore. And while, and I, I, I don't think that having to marry and do all of those things and being a, a careful person is, those things are, aren't mutually exclusive. Like, I, I, I think that you can be a moral, care, caring person and still not do everything right. You know what I mean? And so I am all about embracing the new right now. And I think that it's been wonderful to be able to kind of be in this environment, you know, and then go back home and be in that beautiful, loving environment as well, you know? Brian Eno, David Bowie, like, why were they right? To open and close this Well, movie. my wife is a music person, yeah. and she um, she's wonderful that way, and she's brilliant, just impeccable tastes, you know. And so, I'm just a jerk with all that stuff. Like I'm, I'm a bit. Well, that's not true. I love different things. I love Roberta Flack, and I love you know Stevie Wonder. But she is a huge you know new wave British whole. And David Bowie was somebody that and prior to that, David Bowie is somebody that's a a hero to her. She has posters all over the basement of David Bowie still. <laughs> um, so one of the, Not in we the were editing way. the film and my children were being as children are. And um, she started humming, Oh You Pretty Things. And I was like, Anthony, who's the editor? I was like, stick that up front. Cause we were gonna use, um, we we're gonna use an Elastica song, you know? And um, Connection, uh, Connection, you know, the Connection. And she, I was like, stick that one. You wanna sing it? Um, Elastica Connection, do you know that one? Oh, okay. Maybe if you sing a few bars. No, or... I'm not just singing. <laughs> Although, don't ask me to sing because I can sing. No, anyway. Um, but I'll sing you a Roberta Flack song. Um, uh, so she started humming, Oh, You Pretty Things, and I was like, put that in. And she, he's like, I'm not putting it in because we're not going to be able to get it. There's no way that we're going to get this. And I was like, just put it in. And Rose was like screaming over the phone because she was in Berlin, and she was like, don't even try it. I don't. I don't want to have this conversation. I don't want to have this fight later. I just don't. I was like, just put it in. And it worked. So, um, I mean, it really worked. Everybody <laughs> loved it working there. You know, it was like, you know, the aliens coming down and the this and the that. And, you know, where are we now? And who are we? And it was all about, you know, it was all about a new place, a new time, yeah. you know? And um, when Barb Morrison, long, long answer, I'm sorry, but um, when so the Bowie song was terrific, and then when Barb Morrison, who is the composer, saw it, she said, Stacy, what you have is this sort of, you have this concoction going on, you're, you're, a, you're a collageist in some way, you know, in terms of the film. So I think that we should take the bent of a music for airports type of thing, and I was like, gulp, I love you, Barb Morrison. So she's like, let's weave it through. And then I was like, well, what about an Eno song for the end, though, to kind of come full circle? And she's like, I was like, what, a, what about some of them are old? Because that is amazing, and that's that time, you know, that we're trying to evoke in many ways, yeah. you know? And, um, and she just was like, of course. And we tried it, and it worked. And then we worked on the score and weaved it through, so it's sort of from Bowie to Eno. And in terms of you Rose's know, job of trying to get approvals on it, it wasn't as... You know, Cliff helped us a lot, who is our financier and, and friend. Yeah. And uh, he, he uh, we, we couldn't afford music supervision to that extent. So he put his a beautiful uh, head of uh, licensing on on the, on the music supervising role. Yeah. And her name is Brooke Primont. And she used to work at BMG. And, um, and she just has relationships. So she was able to secure this. And the, I guess what I should say to your audiences is that Mr. Bowie and Mr. Eno you know, have been very generous. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. And they are they were willing to, and their management was willing to grow with us. And yeah. that's the new model. Yeah. And so we were very thankful to them for, uh, for that. And in terms of choosing Montclair? I live in Montclair. You do. So it's, uh, so it's personal. It was easy. So did you, you didn't have to work, or did you work with like a New Jersey Film Commission type person? Yeah, we worked with them. Um, we, you know, we permitted with them. Um, but we, uh, we, I love the town of Montclair. I mean, there's a lot of amazing people. It's interesting because you, you know, all of those New York suburbs are, are strange because, um, 
you know, they are a little ice stormy because they are, they are sort of, there's, there's a lot of sort of intelligentsia, like my, my neighbor lives next to David Carr, and I mean, my friend lives next to David Carr, and like, I live next to this branding guru, and like, and then like, you know, I was talking to Alexandra Pelosi the other day at the Women's Brunch, and she's like, I want to move to Montclair. <laughs> I was like, what? You know, so it was, it's very interesting. Around every corner, you have like a writer or a this, and you're like, you know, Daniel London did the piece because he's like a neighbor, wow. you know? And right. I was like, this is, you know, some, sometimes it can be hard to live in the suburbs, certainly, as you could see in my film, but sometimes it's actually, you know, if you meet the right people, it's fun. Well, sometimes it's good to live in the suburbs, and sometimes it's good to get a baseball to the head. Sometimes it's really good to get a baseball to the head. Although my son, my son wants to be a professional baseball player, and I think you know I feel so bad because he'll forever be guilty. You know, I mean, every time he's gonna see this film, you know, I won't let him see it now. But every time he sees it, he knows what it's about. You know, she gets a, a blow to the head, and that really happened. And it hit this, it hit, hit that part where, you know, it could have killed. <laughs> killed me but it was, and I don't tell him that but it was a little sliver you know that that was right on that vein oh. and then I mean it, it was like literally like everywhere on that diamond and and both kids were culpable because you know my my daughter was screaming that she needed attention and you're always dividing attention and and it, you know that scene actually unfortunately is very real yeah, makes it also easy to deal with. Do you have kids? I have one. Right, but so you're like... <laughs> no, my one doesn't move around yet. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Well, you can't yell at them until they're three. Yeah. Okay, good That's enough. the rule. All right, well, we super appreciate you coming in and having a chat with us. Congratulations on what must be an incredible week and incredible Thank you. feeling. it's been wonderful.